So um, I'm very grateful to be here. I thank you. Um, uh, Professor Yoash has written a really rewarding book. It was, uh, it was wonderfully educational for me to read it. I learned a great deal. But I, I'm here today, um, uh, as Richard uh, indicated, uh, not to speak with the richness of an historian or the austerity of a philosopher, but I think with the dry as dust uh, perspective of a lawyer, which I'll do. Um, and I, so what I want to say about the book is that it, it is a genealogy of human rights. And what do lawyers do? They make distinctions and they, they say exactly what do we mean by human rights? What are human rights? As we've seen in the discussion for the last day and a half, it covers a multitude of different phenomena. Sometimes we've talked here about human rights as a discursive practice, as a practice of justifying oneself to others. Other times we've talked about them as a set of positive rights that are embodied in specific treaties, as a set of legal procedures. Sometimes we're talking about human rights as rights against the state that can be in a national constitution as well as an international document. Sometimes we're talking about human rights as an international um, uh, a set of norms that apply as against uh, member states of an organization, but not as national rights. Sometimes we're talking about human rights as enforceable, and sometimes we're talking about them as not enforceable. These are all completely different phenomena, and you would have a different genealogy depending on exactly what are you talking about. And the notion of sacralization, the way uh, Professor Yoash explains it, is a very capacious concept. It can explain many, many different things, but um, I think actually it's not an innocent concept. Um, it's a concept that I think points uh, the book toward a specific concept of what human rights is about, and that is the dignity of the person. So it goes to this notion of dignity, it goes to a notion of what uh, a person is, and the exemplary case which the book uh, unfolds, which I think is uh, consistent with this account, is the, uh, the gradual abolition of torture as a cultural phenomenon, which reflects the respect in which persons are held. Um, but if you're going to explain different kinds of phenomena, you would point to a different genealogy, which is the point that Tom was making um, earlier. So just to go back, for example, to Article One of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, and of the Citizen, it says, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good. Right? So that is something which seems to found the notion of a right in a certain relationship between the person and the state. Uh, a certain notion of equality, a certain notion of law, a certain notion of a participation in the making of law, a certain notion of civil rights of property, a public-private distinction. There's a whole lot of phenomena there which might be rooted and explained by sacralization. They might equally well be rooted in political changes in the relationship between authority and, and citizenship, uh, between law and the person, between equality as citizen and status as noble or common or whatever. And there are a lot of different phenomena there that one might uh, take as the central case to be explained. So if you actually look at the way uh, human rights are applied, say, in a court like the Strasbourg Court, the, the European Court of Human Rights, most of the rights there are not about torture. They're about procedural rights. They're about what we would call due process in the United States. They're about the steps that the law must go through in treating a person. So they're very much about the nature of law, the nature of the relationship between law and the person. And that you would maybe think about a genealogy of, of, of law and state institution building as a central kind of genealogy. Of course, this is a cultural phenomenon. Um, I won't rise to the level of the anthropological because it it's really exists and comes into existence at a certain moment in time. Um, uh, and if we're willing to push it at a high enough level of generality, we can get back to the sacralization of the person. But it wouldn't come first to mind when one is thinking about the procedural rights that will typically involve a court of, of human rights. But let's focus. Uh, dignity is, of course, a major human right. So let's look at the idea of, of um, dignity. Um, dignity has been important uh, in the West for uh, millennia. Um, but the original meaning of dignity um, and I would say the major meaning of dignity, at least before World War II, had to do with office and social role. There was the dignity of the office, not of the individual uh, person. So for example, in the English Bill of Rights, 1689, it refers to the crown and 
the royal dignity, the dignity that it pertains to the office of the crown. And this persists, this notion of dignity and role persists into human rights language. So let me read you a passage, say, from the Arab Charter on Human Rights. This is uh, written in 2004. It says, men and women are equal in respect of human dignity, rights and obligations within the framework of the positive discrimination established in favor of women by the Islamic Sharia, other divine laws, and by applicable laws and legal instruments. That's defining the dignity of women by reference to the role of women as defined by Sharia law, for example. Or I'll give you this passage from the Chinese Constitution of 1982. The state upholds the uniformity and dignity of the socialist legal system. It's the system which has the dignity, it's the dignity of the system. Or in the preamble to that Chinese constitution, the people of all nationalities, all state organs, the armed forces, all political parties, and public organizations have the duty to uphold the dignity of the constitution. Right? That is not well explained by the notion of the sacralization of the person. That's the dignity of the, of the role of the, of the constitution. And this idea of uh, dignity as role was dominant in private law. The law of defamation, used to, that's the law of libel, used to protect the person in the sense of protecting the honor of the person. My honor is a function of my social role. So for example, in Prussia in 1918, bourgeois, so if you were bourgeois, you couldn't sue for defamation because you had no honor. Only the nobles could sue because they had honor. Would we talk about the dignity of the person in the context of private law of libel? It's the generalization of honor to all persons. So dignity begins to derive from a history that is not the sacralization of the individual person, but precisely the generalization of a certain social role, an aristocratic uh, social role. Um, dignity is another way of saying in many private law contexts that every person has honor honor being here a certain set of so mutual social expectations. But let's put aside that notion of dignity. The notion of dignity, which I think is at the heart of the genealogy that Yoash presents itself to, uh, presents to us, is um, the notion of the individual person as having a unique and special um, dignity. And that notion of dignity emerges full blast after World War II. One sees it in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has the, the out, uh, beginning sentence, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity, that's how we know we're dealing not with the social role, but with the person itself, inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace. This notion of dignity, one begins to see episodically in legal text in the 20th century. One sees it in the 1917 Constitution of Mexico, the 1919 Constitutions of Weimar and Finland, in Portugal in 33, in Ireland in 37, 1940 in Cuba, and so forth. But the most basic uh, rendering of this text is, of course, um, Article I of the German Basic Law, which uses the word, as Professor Yoar says, inviolable. Um, and it's often taken uh, to be a reflection of uh, Catholic personalism after World War II, the only sort of ethical system left standing in place uh, in Germany after, after the uh, Holocaust. Um, but this notion of the inviolable, that is to say the sacred dignity of each uh, person, is um, very influential in modern uh, human rights law, and one sees it in many contemporary human rights uh, instruments. So what is it exactly that we see when courts uh, take it upon themselves to enforce the dignity of the person? What, what is that uh, concept that they enforce. And here, if you look, um, and here I'm going to take up Richard's invitation to be the legal realist, um, because I think uh, when, once you inhabit the role of law, it's not like a dictionary. It's not like you get the answer by looking at a text. You have to see anthropologically what we're doing when we uh, do sorts of laws. So um, it comes up in many different issues, many different contexts. So we're talking about end of life, the right, say, to physician-assisted suicide. You're living out your life. Your, your life has become an indignity to you. It's suffering. You want to end it. Do you have the right to end your own life? And, the, and if you look at legal cases involving this, you will see the dignity of the person invoked to mean, on the one hand, the right to life itself, and on the other hand, the right to choose. Two completely incompatible ideas of dignity, both invoked under the name of dignity, both invoked in the name of the human right, of the dignity of the person, completely opposite senses. Or take another context, abortion, which is much litigated in the human rights world. What is, when you see people invoke dignity, and you do it a lot, 
um, Justice Kennedy being a, a perfect Catholic example in the United States, very Catholic-influenced use of the word dignity. Um, when you see that word invoked in the context of abortion controversies, what does it mean? You see at least, at least four different meanings to the word dignity. One is the right to choose. It's my dignity as a woman to choose my fate. So it's my autonomy, kind of a Kantian sense. Second, you see it in life itself, just like you see it in the uh, end of life cases. It's the life of the fetus, the dignity of the fetus, that it's treated just as a thing. Third, you see it in the, in the sense that we saw it in the Declaration of Human It's inclusion. Professor Yoash theorizes this notion of inclusion. As a woman, it's my right to, to be included in the polity. I can't be a fully equal citizen unless I can control my uh, reproductive life. So the, my dignity is my dignity to be equal to every other citizen. So it's a notion of dignity as equality. And um, th fourth, you see it uh, very much, say, in red states, your dignity in the role as a woman. What is your role as a woman? It's to reproduce and to be a mother very much like you saw in the Arab Charter of Human Rights, this notion of a gender-based fulfillment of your natural role. And dignity is invoked in all of these different contexts, completely different meanings of dignity, all of them unselfconsciously and um, authentically put forward as the meaning of dignity in the context of human rights. Or uh, what about, say, dignity um, in the context of affirmative social rights? In many constitutions, South Africa being an example, Portugal being another example, dignity is associated with affirmative entitlements. I have a right to health care. I have a right to housing. I have a right to food. The state has to give it to me. So dignity is associated with affirmative social entitlements. In other constitutions, like our own, the dignity is viewed as a negative. It's a right to be free from the interference of the state. So dignity is a negative, dignity is a positive. Well, what about this very basic notion um, which many take to be the premise of dignity, that it's universal. Um, here's one of my favorite cases decided by the European Court of Justice. It's called the Omega Spielhallen case. So what happens is there's an Eng there's a, there's a English company and it manufactures something called a laser drone. You know what a laser drone is? It's where you have these laser guns and you shoot each other and pretend to be dead, but it's, um, it's like a war game in real life, um, but no one gets injured. So a German company buys it, wants to import it, and the German court says, no, you can't play laser war games in Germany because that's inconsistent with human dignity. So now there's a problem because there's a German prohibition on the importation of an English company. Both Germany and Great Britain are members of the European Union, and one of the central principles of the European uh, Union, neoliberalism, is freedom of trade. You can't interfere with trade. Um, so uh, Germany can't ban British goods. That's the premise of the EU, free, it's, a, it's a common market. Except, of course there's always an exception for the most important reasons. Human dignity is a really important reason. So you can ban it for human dignity. But if it's against human dignity, how can the British company be allowed to manufacture it? So is it universal or is it particular? The European Court of Justice tells us dignity is different in Germany than in Great Britain. And that's why they can ban the importation of the laser drum, not universal. Really interesting uh, set of, so whatever meaning that you might want to attribute uh, to dignity, it turns out that the people who use this term in the human rights context mean completely different things by it. It's controversial at the most basic, foundational, fundamental uh, level. As, uh, as a scholar named Ger Jerry Newman has written, quote, international human rights law with its global aspirations has sought to bridge over disagreements concerning whether human dignity has its source in God, in nature, in moral reasoning, in culture, or in positive law. So the question comes up, the anthropological question comes up, what are we doing when we're talking about dignity in the human rights context, since we seem to mean completely different things by it? What do we think we're doing here? So I want to suggest um, uh, an answer, a possible answer to that question, very tentatively, since I don't have much time left. Um, but it's an answer that goes back to the question that I first raised. If you looked at the French Declaration of Rights of Man and of the Citizen, what it's really establishing, to my way of thinking, is a regime of law. It's distinguishing law from politics, and it's saying certain things about the person should be subject to a regime of law. And so when we argue to courts about dignity, what we're really saying, even though we disagree substantively about what dignity is completely, we disagree down to the ground about what it is, what we agree about is that it should be subject to law. 
We're in agreement that this is a subject which should be governed not by politics, nor by war, nor by conquest or violence, but by law. So what does that mean, since the law doesn't seem to have any content? That is to say, dignity means all these different things, different things to people who are involved in the law. So what are we saying when we say it should be governed by law, and then the law has all this different content? I think we need a picture of the law-politics divide, uh, which is, and now I'm going to come back to uh, Tom's notion of anthropology. It's a certain form of social solidarity. That is, how do we get along with each other when we disagree? That's a fundamental problem that any human society faces. There's disagreement, and how do we live with each other with a form of social solidarity in the face of that disagreement? So one possibility is that I kill the people who disagree with me. That's, that's a kind of Schmidtian solution, right? It's enemies and friends and whatever. That's a state of war. Another possibility is that we are going to agree that we're going to agree to disagree and that we'll govern ourselves in the shape of this disagreement, but we are agreed that we should maintain our disagreement. Let's call that a polity. And the central fact about the polity is politics. And the central fact about committing a certain kind of a, a solution to politics is that it is always subject to the ongoing validity of disagreement because we always know and respect that disagreement. That's the meaning of a polity. And what's law? Well, let's say within that polity we say we've actually agreed on something. We've agreed to do X and discrimination or protect dignity. Once we're, we want to live with each other under the illusion that we agree, we can submit it to a different form of solidarity, call it law or call it administ administration. That's another way to do this. Law is the form of, of, of um, social integration that we adopt when we accept the premise that we have agreed. Does that stop our disagreement? No, it doesn't. I mean, law is a site of continuing, ongoing controversy and disagreement but it is a particular kind of disagreement that goes under the illusion of agreement. So the Supreme Court decides an issue like abortion. It says you have a right to abortion. And within the law, that settles the question. You have a right. Does that settle the question? No, because we take it back into the political system and we attempt to change um, the legal system. Law is a site of ongoing, complete contestation. But it has a certain form within it that privileges agreement. That's why it's hierarchical and precedential and has and professional reason, it has all sorts of qualities about it that tames the disagreement. And sometimes our disagreement becomes too violent to remain within the form of law, and so we bring it back into politics, and sometimes we are content to let it remain within the form of law. Now that is an account of a genealogy of living together under law that really goes back to the, I think, the dream, the aspiration of human rights. We want to agree about these things internationally. We want to say that we have agreement about what dignity is or what due process is, et cetera. In reality, of course, we don't. We are utterly um, and, uh, and fundamentally at odds with each other about this question, but we want to. We want to, and so we're gonna create institutions tentatively at first, uh, but no doubt within the decades, coming decades, more robust institutions that will allow us to give more and more content to that disagreement and to that agreement, the agreement to believe that we agree with each other. And that is really what the human rights to me is, is about. And when we speak about dignity, it's the notion that we want to believe with each other, that we have some common view of the human person, of the human person's fate and role. It doesn't mean that we do but it means we want to and we're willing to live within a regime that is premised upon that hope. And that's not a small achievement. Well, we don't have as much time as I'd like for questions, but I feel like I should give you a very short time to reply to the other panelists and then we'll open it up to questions. Of course, I, I'm very grateful to both of you. Let me make a few points as a spontaneous response. First, Tom Lacour. Yes, I start my history of human rights, so to speak, in the second half of the 18th century. Samuel Moyne's book starts it after the Second World War, 
And let's say the people who think that Christianity or the Axial Age traditions or Plato or whatever, they started 2,000 years ago or 2,500 years ago. These are alternatives. I really disagree empirically with Samuel Moyne, but I will not elaborate on that. I think he's really wrong about the 19th century, for example. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, and I would like to emphasize again uh, that my approach is not a legal or intellectual history, but what I call a cultural history. I will come to this anthropological point in, in a second. Second point, Lynn Hunt's, I think, important book, Inventing Human Rights, I would not take it as the prototypical representative of the secular uh, narrative, because the interesting thing in her book, I think, is that she writes also a kind of cultural history, namely the expansion of feelings of empathy in the 18th century. But I personally think that there is an alternative between this emphasis on empathy and the emphasis on value commitments. And that it is not correct to assume that people derive certain value consequences from their psychological ability to have empathy. A, sh a shorthand way to put it, I think, let's say many wives of slaveholders had great empathic abilities in their interaction with their husbands and children, but stopped having empathy <laughs> when the question of the treatment of the slaves came up. And that's also a crucial thing about German 20th century history, of course. Not all these Nazis had a lack of ability of empathy. They were maybe loving fathers and husbands. So I, that is the difference between Lynn Hunt and myself. Third, I'm very grateful that you understood, because many people misunderstand, the status of the chapter five of my book about the Christian understanding of the soul and of the Christian understanding of our life as a gift. Very often people understand it as if after denying the Christian origin, so to speak, of human rights, I somehow contradict myself in a later chapter and now deal with Christianity as if it were nevertheless the only authentic source of a commitment to human rights. And I say, no, but for Christians, so to speak, these two elements are crucial. But for Muslims or Buddhists or secularists, other elements will be crucial when they justify their commitment to William Wright, uh, to human rights. Fourth, I think we should leave the question who Roger Williams was and so on <laughs> out. Yes, I'm not a fan of Roger Williams, but I'm an admirer of, let's say, religious learning processes in the direction of religious freedom. And I think Jelinek was right that the basic logical structure of human rights is contained in this idea of a religiously founded religious freedom. And fifth and last, with regard to Tom, uh, you go back to the fact, and I think it is a fact, that there is no human civilization without a certain respect for dead bodies and without ritualistic practices Many other examples could be given that no, human beings have always been different from merely profane objects in all cultures. But it's a long way from this sacralization of the dead body of a beloved one to the legal codification and institutionalization of human rights. So I agree with you that an, there is an anthropological basis for the special treatment of the human body or the human being, but it would be even more radical than those who claim that it's all already in the Gospels to say it's all already in totemistic uh, rituals. Uh, so a, a lot of things had to happen in human history between this basic structure and the attitude that all human beings have the same right and so on. Okay, Robert Post, very briefly, you, you are totally right that the genealogy depends on the description of what we are talking about. 
I agree with you that procedural rights play a major role, but isn't that true for all value systems and normative systems that very often you have the problem of the internal structure of the normative system or the internal structure of the value system, and then you don't, theology, for example, deals with the internal structure very often of faith-based assumptions. Uh -huh. So you do not necessarily talk about these faith-based assumptions, but you talk about the contradiction between different of them or procedures. Then you spend most of the time of your presentation with a discussion of this concept of dignity, and I would just, that's very important for law, but I would just like to make clear that I have not written about dignity, so to speak. Uh, I use a very artificial notion, the sacredness of the person, to say that, for example, the German understanding of human dignity in constitutional law is one attempt to articulate this sacredness of the person that can, in other legal traditions or other cultural traditions, articulate it in totally different ways. And it's always necessarily vague because values are not legal norms. Yeah? So it's, you should not blame values for not being legal norms, so to speak. They have to be transformed, and this transformation is always controversial. And last thing about the law, coming from a country that had the rule of law before it had democracy, I'm struck by the easiness with which you assume that the rule of law means agreement and a right to participate in making the law. There can be the, uh, Prussia had the rule of law, but certainly no right to participate in, for everybody. Uh, and so I think for you, the connection here between the idea of the rule of law and the idea of the sacredness of the person that everybody is the bearer of the same rights and so on is, is too, uh, it's too close. In, in your understanding of the law, to America. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we got to come back. Um, <laughs> no. yes. You only got to come back when anyone asks you to come back. So if, if there are questions from the audience, we